Hello, I'm Ari. And I'm Claudine. Welcome to Proving the Negative. We're a podcast all about exploring the different sides of cybersecurity, from political science to computer science, international relations to mathematics. Join us as we talk to our friends about the work they do. There's a shift of attention towards cybersecurity. We need to understand that that comes at a cost. It comes There's a, cost. a more complex value chain, if you like, that now sits behind the question of value at the, at the product level. Because we want the smartest room of people to be able to deal with some of the most complex problems. This is something that is truly an international effort where experts from around the world come together to either author, review or provide input on, on cyborgs. The latest cybersecurity strategy starts to expand and to start to tackle some of the really tough problems, but building on what we've already done before. Hello everyone, welcome back to PTN Pod. Great to have you with us. This episode is just a smorgasbord of delights. This is a special episode. We got ourselves invited to a conference. This conference celebrates academic centres of excellence in cybersecurity research. At this conference, there's lots of people interested in cybersecurity, doing the work across the board, cyber physical systems, water, power grids, that kind of stuff. We've got a bit of international relations and politics, how we're teaching, how we're educating. What we're trying to do in the UK is build an ecosystem. This ecosystem will have students and newbies, people building careers and people who have been around for a very long time before cyber even existed. And so we want to bring all this expertise where we're making the UK a safe place to be and a safe place to do business, of course. The UK spends a lot of money on cybersecurity. We're going to start with an introduction to the UK cyber strategy. Now, this is very exciting because that sort of points us in the right direction. We'll be talking to industry, policy and academic people to understand the value of cybersecurity work. The question we're answering here is what kind of bang are we getting for the taxpayer buck as far as cybersecurity is concerned? We will start with the big picture. We'll talk a little bit about the value. What does value look like in the work we do? We'll talk to someone who reminds us that there's a bigger picture. Sometimes we forget there's more to life than than cybersecurity. Just don't tell anyone I, uh, I, I told you that. You'll hear ideas that we've talked about before in various episodes. Uh, the skills gap. We will also introduce you to some new projects, such as the cybersecurity body of knowledge that's been making waves. We wondered why no students were coming to to talk to us. We had a little podcast room set aside from from the main conference. And, uh, well, we found them. We we found where the food was and the free coffee. So at the end of the episode, we've got a few interviews with students who are doing great stuff. Without any further ado, let's rock and roll. I'm Chris Enso. I'm one of the deputy directors of the National Cybersecurity Centre responsible for cyber growth. We all rely on technology today. It, it's just how we live. And ultimately, we need to be safe and secure so people have confidence in it. That's the job of the National Cybersecurity Centre, is how do we make the UK a safe place to live and work online? So the priority for me is how do we make security easy for everybody? It shouldn't be hard. People should be able to use stuff securely by default out of the box. So for me, it's all about how do we make that happen? How do we build in security? How do we make the companies who build software, and this isn't just security software, this is any software, to build it in a way that, that doesn't make people more vulnerable to cyber attack. Cybersecurity fits into the big picture because we rely on technology. And whilst that isn't going to change anytime soon, we want that technology to be secure and robust against any sort of cyber attack. And, and where does it fit into the, into the long term? Will cybersecurity be a discipline into the future? I don't know, but certainly we want cybersecurity built in. Everything should be cyber resilient. And therefore, over time, you'd see the standalone discipline, which is security in the corner, being just part of everyday life so that people don't have to worry about security because it's already there. The latest cybersecurity strategy really begins to tackle some of the longer term problems. So the the use of regulation, the need to really upskill and and look at the education system. So I think there's a lot of hope there that, that we've learned a lot over the last 10 years from the last two strategies. And this one builds on it, but I think starts to expand and to start to tackle some of the really tough problems, but building on what we've already done before. Chris Enzo, Deputy Director for Cyber Skills and Growth, NCSC, National Cybersecurity Centre. Talk about strategy is really helpful because it gives us this roadmap. The place we're trying to go is the UK being a safe place, not just for working, but for living as well. This has to be the same for everyone, regardless of their technical level of expertise. The government is responsible for spending taxpayer money. So the directions that they set has to be resilient. It's got to have this bounce back. What if something does happen? So this long-term plan, this roadmap, this is what the strategy is for. 
Hi, so my name is Bernard Parsons. I'm the CEO of a cybersecurity company called Bcrypt. We're a UK developer of security products and services based in London. The main focus for us at the moment is around endpoint security. The endpoint is where a lot of cyber attacks gain a foothold. Endpoint is a term that is used often to refer to enterprise devices that users are interacting with to carry out their normal working tasks. Typical examples being laptops and desktops, tablets, mobile devices. But actually, it can be viewed more generically than that or more widely than that. There's some work that we've been supporting for NCSC quite recently where actually the term they're using for the focus of that work is enterprise connected devices. So it gets it gets even broader and it starts to pull in things like you know printers and scanners because at the end of the day all of these devices have an increasing amount of intelligence within them and very often what comes with that is increasing vulnerability if you're not managing the sophistication of those devices correctly. So in summary, most of what we do is still around the traditional securing desktops within enterprise environments, but it does extend much more broadly now. We did some work with government a few years ago about developing architectures for endpoint devices that make endpoints much more resilient to attacks and also uh, resistant to more targeted cyber threats. So it's all about reducing endpoint risk within enterprise organizations. Delivering value for money. You, you can come up with the best security architecture in the world for a product, but if you can't deliver that in a way that's also going to tick boxes around usability, around cost of ownership uh, for your target customers, then you're, you're not going to get off the starting line. So it's, it's all about being able to deliver a, a convincing value proposition end-to-end -end -end for our customers. It's interesting to think about how it fits into the big picture because it's quite cross-cutting, isn't it? It's very difficult to think of cyber as being separate. And, and I think that's reflected in the national cyber strategy, isn't it, now? That it, it is the cyber strategy as opposed to specifically cyber security. It cuts across so much of technology, but also cuts over into socio-economic and environmental aspects as well. Gaining the right amount of cyber resilience for whatever your, your organization is about or uh, your entity is about is, is increasingly important. Managing risk as part of whatever you're trying to achieve. Managing cyber-related risk in a way that is appropriate for your organization and for your risk appetite. It's about getting the right controls and processes in place so that you've got a balance between you know the operational efficiency and the the management of cyber related risks at a level that that is appropriate for you side note i asked what value looked like and this is what we talked about i think it very much depends what the scope is right because i could i could take an approach to answering that question where I'm really only going to be concerned in proving to you what the value of my product is. And obviously, it's a much bigger conversation than that, because any one particular product is only going to be part of a much bigger environment and, and set of systems. If I tackle that first at product level, it is a big problem for cybersecurity as a sector. How do we prove or demonstrate the value of what we're building at the level of product? Now, historically what one looked towards to try and answer that question was some kind of product assurance. I'm going to get some independent entity to certify my product against a particular standard, let's say. So product certification, that gives someone a tick in the box and, and we're all happy. I've, I've got some evidence here. And that has, has been really problematic kind of background to come from. So it kind of used to work with very well-defined categories of product. In the early days, what Bcrypt was all about was building encryption products. It's very easy to define a set of standards and criteria. If you're going to build a product to encrypt this kind of device, this is what we want. We want these kind of algorithms, these kind of mechanisms around how you manage credentials and so on. You could get a certification for that, and we used to. It is saying something of value, but then how that artifact sometimes got used by the consumers 
was problematic because what very often would happen is people would use an artifact like a certificate as a proxy for informed risk management, right? So somebody's told me this product is good. I don't really need to think anymore about what I'm storing on it, how long I'm storing it for, and so on. Product certifications have had their challenges even where they can easily be applied. But as technology has evolved and become more diverse, the whole model of traditional product certification has become strained because it's really difficult to follow that model and create criteria for what technologies should and shouldn't do for the vast range of technologies and and categories of technology that we have today. And that's why you're seeing a lot of work taking place in, in the likes of the NCSC, where they're, where they're trying to shift the model more to thinking about, okay, so what are the principles uh, that we think are appropriate to classes of product rather than very prescriptive criteria and making things much, much more outcomes based, looking at what the outcome that falls out of how a particular manufacturer might be building a particular type of product, but also what surrounds that. So what's what what are the processes and provenance of the organization itself and how do we how do we examine that? There's a more complex value chain, if you like, that now sits behind the question of value at the at the product level. And it, but it's quite an evolving space and and, and we're supporting some of the work that, that's in that. It's a, it's a whole different conversation that, that you then have at the, the economic level and, and the environments in which we use products, we sell products. And I think following on from the difficulty in providing assurance in the way that we used to, what that leads to within cyber, I think, and I'm not alone, is an increased amount of information asymmetry. So much of the cyber market is dominated by companies that will spend way more on marketing than they do on R&D. And so, so that leads you to a situation where it's very difficult for buyers to tell the difference between good and bad. And then that drives companies that want to invest in stronger controls out of the market. That drives down the average value, <laughs> if you like, of products that are being delivered in the market. The kind of net result of that is the investment from companies within sectors that need to demonstrate security and and resilience without a net increase in that resilience. Dr. Bernard Parsons, MBE, CEO of Bcrypt. Talking about organisational security, it's very, very important in reducing the risk that your computers, printers, whatever, that these devices pose to a business, they're first steps in protecting that business. If some hacker was going to try and get in, those things would be first on on the checklist, trying to find holes, trying to find weaknesses. The way we do business is changing. The technology we develop is being developed very fast and it's very clever and it's sucking up a whole lot of data. Oversight and quality checking has never been more important. Rather than having tick boxes, which are helpful, the first step is, is having some expert let you know where your priority should be, where the money, where you should spend some money. What's the number one thing to, to address? But if you don't have someone like that, you can still ask yourself questions like, what do we want this technology to do? How do we expect this thing to happen? And what don't we want? What is not acceptable? My name is Harmony Toros. I'm a reader in international conflict analysis at the University of Kent. I research security, negotiations and violence. My priority is to ensure that a lot of the strong research that has been carried out in security studies, and particularly critical security studies, is learned from by the cybersecurity community, both the academic and the policy community. Because I think it's important that we understand that a lot of the terms that we use and a lot of the policies that are use these terms are actually can be very complicated and, and have upsides and downsides. The main problem I, I'm addressing is that at the moment Also because it's a new field, cybersecurity, it's a new area, there is a tendency of seeing security as a positive, which it usually is, I would agree with that, but sort of uncritically, and and resilience as a positive, but uncritically, for example. I've had many conversations here. I've asked people, "Do do you see that difference between security and resilience is actually also a political difference, right? Security is the state's responsibility and a company's responsibility to make sure that people are secure. 
Resilience, it is the person's responsibility to be resilient. There's a shift of responsibility that happens there. These are important questions because they have important legal and political implications in the lives of ordinary people. That really is my goal, to transfer these, these reflections and this critical engagement we've had in security studies into cybersecurity. I come from a terrorism studies background. That's what I studied for a, a very long time. One of my main concerns is that however many governments would decide that terrorism was either the greatest or one of the greatest threats to national security, I could find very little evidence of that fundamentally. I mean, if a country like the UK tells me that terrorism is the greatest threat to the national security, I just, I can't understand how that is the case. There's no metric that brings terrorism as one of the greatest threats to national security. However, it was there. It was there in all the documents. It was there in the money being poured into it. And now there's a shift because we're finally moving away from terrorism, but there's a shift of attention towards cybersecurity. We need to understand that that comes at a cost. It comes at a cost of funding going to other important areas of, in, of human security in this country, such as mental health, such as education, such as social services, such as safe spaces. I mean, all these things. We need to know that if we're moving all this attention towards cybersecurity, that it is really a threat to national security. How is it a threat to national security? And how much money do we have to put into this and how much attention? We need to make sure that security questions are looked at outside of the silo of security, right? Because, of course, within the security world, cybersecurity is very important. But then we have to look at it in a broader societal way, right? What are the other problems we are facing? What are the other essential questions that we need to address? Because if you only look at cybersecurity within the security silo, it seems essential. If you look at it in the broader question, then you understand that, well, if we're focusing on this, we're not focusing on that. And those are other costs, right? I'm going to end with a little anecdote. In conferences, I get often asked, what is the greatest security threat? My answer is always, it's slightly tongue in cheek. I say, well, the greatest security threat statistically to me is my husband, right? Because I'm more likely to be killed by my husband than by anybody else, right? And the greatest security threat to most men in the room are themselves because they're more likely to commit suicide than they are to be killed by anybody. Mm. We need to think about security in that way. We need to think about the other ways in which people are hurt and people suffer rather than only in the sort of very narrow security field. Dr. Harmony Torres, reader in International Conflict Analysis and Deputy Director of the Institute of Cybersecurity for Society. ICSS, University of Kent. In this conversation, we're talking about how the words we use matter. This is important, particularly around policy making, because the policies that direct public funding are steeped in assumptions. We need to draw out what assumptions we're making, look at the bigger picture and be very specific about what needs addressing. Who is at risk? What can we do about it? And what should the bare minimum be? This is particularly important around cybersecurity because it's fairly new and there is some risk of it being overhyped. Rather than reinventing a shiny new wheel, we could just use the ones we have, take stock, be critical, and only promise things that can realistically happen. I realise I'm asking for the world here, but this is why I've enjoyed this conversation so much. The takeaway for me, as a cybersecurity person, is that the world is much, much bigger than I am, and having a micro-focus, having a laser focus, is a problem, because then you end up oversimplifying or even ignoring real problems. I'm Farah, I'm the RITIX program manager. RITIX is a program that's funded by EPSRC and the NCSC. It's coordinated by the ISST at Imperial College London, which is the London hub for security research and engagement. We give money out to people to do projects and then they will come in and answer some questions or topics that we have from cyber physical systems. When you think about cyber physical systems, people don't realise it's attached to our everyday life. Like a colleague I once met was pregnant, she gave birth. The computer systems within that hospital were hacked. Because that happened, she actually was administered, I think, the wrong amount of medication and she actually became deaf. But you can see the implications the attack had. It's so important for us to become stronger in cyber security and make it more secure and do more research into that particular field. Cyber is involved in everything and anything, mm -hmm. from ships to planes to boats. So why is it important in cyber physical systems? Because we're all interconnected. We're connected with each other. Everything runs off each other. It doesn't rely on one source. You need multiple things. So if you're flying a plane, you've got security systems trying to keep it all safe, make sure no one can hack into it to overtake the plane and crash it somewhere. You need the systems on the plane to keep running. And then when you're in the airports, for you to receive the correct information, 
it's not just one branch, it's all connecting to one another. I think you need to have a lot of skills. I think, so I have a degree in forensics, a master's in security and resilience. I have a lot of skills, so communication, networking, uh, administration. You need to be able to talk to people, kind of mingle in with them, know what to ask, when to ask. You need to know how to navigate your way around people within academia, people within the government. For example, people working in the industry are a little bit more formal, whereas people in academia are a little bit more relaxed. You need to be able to assess and adjust yourself to that particular situation and be observant. Not everyone has those skills. Farah Hussain, Program Manager for RITIX, the Research Institute in Trustworthy, Interconnected, Cyber-Physical Systems. Farah talks about how interconnected these cyber-physical systems are. We'll talk about cyber-physical systems again later, actually. A couple of examples of these, if you're not quite sure. Water systems, energy systems, anything that's also physical. It's not just in a computer. She also talked a bit about the kind of skills that are useful in navigating a government-funded cybersecurity research program. That, that's what she does. The point I wanted to get across here is that you don't need to be super technical to appreciate the complexity of systems. There are different kinds of technicality and different areas of expertise. So it's important that the kind of skills that help Farah get her job done, communication, networking, whatever, these are helpful to have and we shouldn't overlook them academic centres of excellence, they're really only one piece of the puzzle. There's all sorts of networks and hubs of expertise, people sharing ideas. It's not just about having rock star researchers. I'm Fabio Pierazzi. I'm a lecturer from King's College London and I work at the intersection of AI and system security. AI is really the most viable solution for protecting systems in the long term, especially given the scalability of threats that are appearing in the wild and the fact that attackers have so much more resources than defenders typically. The main challenge in this, I think, is bridging the semantic gap between uh, AI and machine learning experts uh, designing these systems and the people that can actually benefit from using it, like the security analysts. Mm -hmm. So in the uh, research community, we have a lot of explanation methods and explanation systems understood mostly by machine learning experts. The very important thing is to create uh, solutions that can uh, be understood and used by real-world analysts that don't know necessarily much about the topic. Whenever I design a new project or when contributing to malware detection, I really ask myself how it can be useful for a security analyst and how it can uh, help uh, uh, in detecting malware while being practical, being able to practically deploy it in the wild. I engage with, I mean, I have discussions frequently with other research academics about these topics, but also with industry about the needs that they have. I have an ongoing collaboration with Avast and I've been talking also with NCC Group. Uh, to some extent, we talk different languages, even when we talk just about research. So research in academia means publishing papers, whereas in industry, it's more about uh, working towards the mission of the company and making the systems more effective or efficient. Uh, I mean, I tend to talk a lot to industry people and want to learn from them. So I think it's important that we keep bridging this communication gap. Cybersecurity fits everywhere. To some extent, it's really about creating safe spaces for people. Most of my research focuses on system security, so it's the protection of systems, something that typically happens maybe behind the curtains. It protects people, keeps their data safe, especially even their money safe. So I think it's cybersecurity should really create a better and more peaceful society. Dr. Fabio Pirazzi, lecturer in computer science at King's College London. When Fabio is talking about bridging a semantic gap, we're coming back to words, vocabulary. Everyone speaks a slightly different language and it really is worth the time making sure we're on the same page. He's also talking about making sure that research is informed by the needs of the people who are going to use whatever it is you build. It's got to be useful. Translational work is important particularly in cybersecurity, being able to speak to different people in their own words to get the job done, or maybe a shared language. Whatever it is, this idea of translating to make sure we're all pulling in the same direction. That's what I wanted to draw your attention to. Without this work, you build things that aren't helpful, they're not useful, they're not usable, and, worst case, it's a waste of taxpayer money. So I'm John W5. I work in the NCSE. Uh, I work in a team called the Socio-Technical Security Group. We undertake multidisciplinary research into cybersecurity problems. 
what that means is trying to take on board different academic disciplines, for example, psychology, economics, artificial intelligence, sociology, and trying to look at these problems from a sort of uh, multidisciplinary perspective to understand them, rotate them around, and see if we can develop a more complex, nuanced model of um, how we might address them or manage them. There's a range of problems that we look at, but effectively, uh, you know, it goes back to the NCSE mission. How do we keep the UK safe online? And from that, there's a whole raft of things that spill out. So, for example, we care about assurance. We care about cyber incidents. We want to understand what happens with them. We want to understand how we can manage them more effectively, how we can learn from them, and how we can sort of try and put in place mitigations for this. If I'm looking at sort of uh, economics, I might look at trying to apply that to ransomware and, you know, what are the sort of implications within that. To do that, we actually go out to a broad network of sort of expertise that sits beyond the team in sort of uh, academia and through sort of HMG and with Five Eyes and also with commercial partners as well. So it's really trying to sort of expand the room because we want the smartest room of people to be able to deal with some of the most complex problems. But to do that, we have to sort of go beyond our boundaries to actually draw in the sort of the biggest, smartest room with the available people to sort of help us tackle some of these long-term systemic problems in cybersecurity. We're always looking for what we describe as lenses. So the lenses are different academic disciplines. In the last two years, I've been looking at uh, economics building a network of expertise across the sort of sectors that I just mentioned, and then trying to develop sort of a set of research questions, which is going to tackle and feed back into the sort of priorities of things that we care about. Having done that, I'm now looking at sort of like a new sort of space, which is how can we bring in international dimensions, international relations into that as well. So all the time, it's about trying to sort of identify, you know, what's the new thing in terms of sort of technology, in terms of academic disciplines that can help us develop that sort of more nuanced understanding of you know, these deep-suited I think also problems is probably the wrong word. I think there are also there are opportunities as well as problems. And I think part of it is also trying to kind of frame it in that way because it goes beyond the sort of uh, safety into sort of almost, you know, how could you think about something more positive in terms of, how, you know, how can people live their best lives online? We're increasingly sort of living online and we're living sort of kind of blended distributed existences. And a part of it is about how do we sort of do that uh, best? You know, how can we sort of uh, have safe, happy communities, but also live individual lives? where, you know, some of the sort of challenges that are posed by technology can be sort of addressed and thought about in advance. On the flip side of that, there are sort of, you know, um, bigger sort of questions about sort of people that seek to sort of cause, cause problems to that. And that's, you know, part of the NCSE's mission is about protection. So whether that's from the nation states or criminal gangs or even, you know, technology can also have unintended consequences itself. You don't necessarily need sort of malactors in there. Mm-hmm. You can have unintended consequences. The root of what we do in the socio-technical security group is systems thinking. That's, you know, one of the core sort of lenses or disciplines that sits at the root of what we do. The more complex systems and more complex sort of um, interactions you have from systems of systems, the more unexpected outcomes and the more, and, you know, technology is a big sort of factor X in all of that. I couldn't resist asking John about systems of systems. We've come across cybernetics before in the show. The idea that whenever you have a big system made up of smaller systems, it gets really complex. I wanted to ask, how on earth do you manage all of that work? With complexity, quite often it's about sort of managing it. And also, we, you know, you're not looking at something which is um, static. You're looking at something which is dynamic and changing. So even if you kind of get the snapshot right. So, I mean, the, the sort of the spiel that quite often I use when I have a PowerPoint set of slides, which we be thankful now I don't have here, is I talk about the idea it takes a village to raise a child. And if you were going to model that from a sort of a, the multidisciplinary perspective, you'd say what goes into the raising of that child. You could talk about the parents, the school, you could talk about the, the village itself, and you could talk about the, the child's own sort of psychological development. And if you wanted to understand that, you could then go into, for example, Bowlby for attachment theory for understanding the relationship with the child. If you wanted to go beyond that, you'd look at sort of anthropology and you'd look at a whole raft of other sort of uh, disciplines like educational theory to understand the school. And you, could, you could keep on going out, but at some point you have to sort of bound the system. And there's an interesting quote, I think, which is from George Box, the idea that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think we're, we're never going to get it right. It's because it's changing. It's always going to be something we need to keep on advancing our understanding. But then from our perspective, you know, we're not looking at that model for the sort of, you know, the child. We're interested in, if it takes a village to raise a child, it takes an ecosystem to produce a, a cyber incident. So these things don't just happen by themselves. So you don't, for example, you know, it's not, not, not a case that the hardware goes wrong or software goes wrong mm-hmm. or that people did something wrong or bad people came along and did something. You've got to try and understand the sort of the much broader sort of ecosystem and in that, you could look at social networks, you could look at hardware, you could look at policies, you could look at supply chains, you could look at assurance. You know, there's a whole raft of things like social engineering. And behind each of those sort of issues then sits sort of sub So the question is, 
how can we sort of reach out, draw on the knowledge and expertise that sits in different disciplines and bring them together? One of the things that we're doing at the moment is we're looking at ransomware. What can we do about ransomware? We have a series of projects working with economists to try and understand if we look at an illegal marketplace like ransomware, we have lots of really interesting stuff about uh, how uh, we prevent market failures using economic theory. What happens if we flip that on its head? You know, we want to actually use economic theory to try and understand how we can degrade and actually prevent a marketplace from working. That's great, but how do we actually road test that? It's very difficult because you can't get data on marketplaces. You can get historical data sets. We're currently working with uh, medieval historians mm-hmm. looking at how different illegal marketplaces were disrupted back in the day by things like the Catholic Church. What's very interesting is if you take the, sort of the, the structure of those marketplaces, talking to our technical directors who look at this stuff, you can see it maps across very, very strongly to the, sort of, you know, the marketplace for ransomware. The point is you've got triangulation. This is telling you from potentially a policy level about how you can actually uh, use that understanding from the past, using economists, using the NCSE technical expertise in this area, but also using medieval historians to bring those things together to try and identify where we should potentially be focusing our energies and trying to disrupt what's a growing threat to the UK. That was John from the Socio-Technical Security Group, NCSC. John is talking about the importance of socio-technical work and bringing different disciplines together to solve real, large-scale problems. This is super important because we can't just simplify things. A lot of the time it's not about everybody understanding the problem. It's about technical experts really digging into their areas of expertise and then having that person like John or however it is that they do it to a level where we can understand what that means in real terms and then move forward. We're coming back to we get there together, we protect things together, we develop an approach together or we don't understand this problem at all. I love the idea that You don't want to be the smartest person in the room. You want the entire room to be smart. This idea that people have different approaches, I completely resonated with. There is very little that I have in common with a medieval historian. Innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum. We can't rely on a genius rock star researcher working in isolation. It's much more about creating space for this work to happen. I'm Avesh Rashid. I'm professor of cybersecurity at the University of Bristol, and I lead the cybersecurity body of knowledge cyborg project. Hi, I'm Andrew Martin. I'm a professor of system security at the University of Oxford, and I'm a member of the executive board of the Cyber Project. I'm Professor Steve Schneider. I'm at the University of Surrey. I'm director of the Surrey Centre for Cybersecurity, and I'm also an executive board member of the uh, Cybersecurity Body of Knowledge. Cyborg was born out of a need. Most mature disciplines uh, have bodies of knowledge on which they can draw upon to build education and training programs. Cybersecurity as a field has grown in maturity, but it did not have such a body of knowledge on which educators and trainers could draw upon to build their programs. Also, how do we know what good looks like when we are trying to you know, train people in, in this area, given that there is a plethora with varying quality? So is there an authoritative source to which you can go? The challenges are articulated in the aims that we set ourselves. The project was funded by the UK's National Cybersecurity Programme. But of course, cybersecurity and the UK's cybersecurity doesn't live in isolation from the rest of the world. And while we have some excellent expertise in the UK, there are also a number of really excellent experts around the planet. So I think the biggest challenge has been to make sure that this is something that is truly an international effort, where experts from around the world come together to either author, review, or provide input on on cyborg but also how do we actually maintain the rigor of that process? So it's not just, you know, members of the cyborg editorial team or executive board sitting in a room making those decisions. Community has to be involved in it, but also when someone looks at it, they go, yes, these people are really the experts in the field. And I'm going to borrow from someone else who who said this to me, that cyborg's author and reviewer list reads like a who's who of cybersecurity, because these are really people who are experts in the field. That credibility comes from both the expertise of the people, also the rigor through which we go in uh, reviewing and editing the material that they produce, and also the wider community input that comes in through the processes that we have when we develop this material. There are a number of key things that have happened. Of course, the biggest use case has been that in the UK, we have certification program by the National Cybersecurity Center, and now it uses Cyborg as its basis. So if there are certified degrees in uh, at undergraduate or postgraduate level in the UK in cybersecurity, then they're based on Cyborg. So we're actually using it in education and training materials. It's also being used as a guide by people to design new types of uh, new, new, new courses. But also what it allows you to do is to compare where the focus of different programs lie. 
there isn't a singular cybersecurity expert. The kind of people you need to build new types of cryptographic mechanisms or use them in particular settings are very different than people who work in a security operations center. Both are equally valuable, but the knowledge that you need and the skills that will then build on that knowledge is different, and it allows you to see whether different programs are delivering that relevant knowledge or not. There's a number of activities that we've got going on at the moment to bring Cyborg out to the, the wider communities. We're running a call for um, small projects at the moment. We've had two very successful runs at this already and have built up a good body of supplementary material that's used to support the teaching and the kind of dissemination of Cyborg. And we have another call at the moment. So we're looking for, for more small projects for the community to, to develop. But now we're also looking to recruit some industry champions, so people that have a good understanding of the, the industry landscape and where Cybot will fit within that. And we'll work with the Cybot team and also with industry to embed Cybot more in, in how industry is, is using it. We're developing knowledge guides, new emerging knowledge that we want to um, capture. Um, and also topic guides, which is where particular topics are embedded in a number of different chapters within, within Cyborg, and it's about bringing them together. At the moment, we're looking at security of AI systems as a new kind of emerging area, and also the use of AI in cybersecurity, which appears in various places in Cyborg, and we're wanting to bring that together. Any discipline changes and develops over time, and that's certainly true of cybersecurity. We want the Cyborg to remain relevant which means it mustn't become ossified and stuck in the past, become something that nobody looks at, and nor do we want it to be something that becomes a straitjacket for people relying on it and, and not keeping up with innovation in the field. Ever since we first published the, the, the first edition of Cyborg, we've had a process for people to put in change requests. People can spot errors or typos, or they may want to comment that um, some area has simply gone out of date and needs a little bit of updating with current thinking, or maybe to propose something that we've missed and something that really needs to be added. We're also aware that people are busy and, and they may think of those things but not always get round to telling us. We're about to put in place some processes by which we proactively go out and look at a number of the knowledge areas in Cyborg together and ask whether they're, they're still really a good summary of the, of the state of knowledge or whether they need a bit of an update, a bit of a reorganization of material perhaps. And we'll get some experts to do that and to feed in maybe their own change requests to keep us, keep us on our toes, as it were. And then periodically, we expect to do a much bigger review of the, of the overall scope of the Cyborg, just to make sure that um, it really remains aligned with the, the community's thinking on where cybersecurity is at. I asked who this community was, and I really liked what they had to say. I would say this is my personal view, not the Cyborg Project's view. <laughs> I think our community is any professional in cybersecurity who wants to learn about a topic. They are the first and foremost community, because ultimately Cyborg is used to build education and training programs for them. Cyborg is a way potentially for employers to see whether they have the knowledge. But at the heart of it, we always talk about the kind of cybersecurity workforce gap. And it's those people who want to gain that knowledge. They are our primary community. The reason this is so important is the beneficiaries of, of all this and of the increasing our capability in cybersecurity is the whole nation. The reason it's important is because we're talking about the, resi the resilience and the ability to maintain the, the infrastructure and the, the whole of the kind of society running, running effectively through making sure that we, that we have the right skills in order to make sure that the kind of systems and etc. All, all work in, in the way that they should. Part of our um, objective has been not to have a boundary to the community. So the Cybot resources are freely available for download and you don't have to tell us who you are when you download them. And that means we get lots of fun information about people telling us that they're using Cybot right across the world in a variety of new ways. And so the community is boundless. The Cybersecurity Body of Knowledge Project has brought together documents, people, a lot of areas of expertise to map out different topics within cybersecurity. Really important. This work is giving people who create teaching materials and education programs content to work with. It's particularly cool because they don't track you when you access their website. That's what I love. 
As a result of this work, cybersecurity as a field is being taken more seriously in the UK. We're seeing standards being mapped out right now. We're seeing professional bodies forming around this. It was a real privilege to get to talk to them. I'm Andrew Hood. I'm a lecturer in cybersecurity at Cardiff University. One of the problems we're trying to solve at the moment is recruitment within cyber and the difficulty, especially within academia, of finding talent to be able to work on our research, uh, especially post-Brexit as well. I come from industry and I've also been a youth offending officer. I've worked a lot with uh, young people and one of the things we tend to miss is the talent that's available within that group. When I started at universities, I noticed that we were having hundreds of these young people come in with really enthusiastic ideas, but nobody was taking them seriously and nobody was working on it. At Warwick and now at Cardiff, I started a program whereby rather than trying to recruit an individual to do a research assistant role for our research, I would take that role and I would break it up into a pool of hours and I would recruit a set of undergraduate students to come and do the work paid. And we can use uni temps and job shop and the, the infrastructures that universities already have to allow us to do this. What I end up then is a lovely stripey team from all different departments, not just computer science, um, psychology students, all the rest, come together as undergraduates and they work on the research together. They've been very, very successful. Warwick, I had 26 undergraduates go through paid work, and we're just starting a new program now at Cardiff with six students working on a project funded with the Alan Turing Institute. At the moment, the priority is to build up our skill set within industry, within UK PLC. We have a, a huge shortage of skills within cyber at the moment, particularly technical skills. Um, we're really struggling to find people who are, uh, have uh, backgrounds in hardware, cyber resilient systems, all those sorts of things. And that starts at university. That starts with this identifying the talent early and as universities nurturing it and growing it before releasing it out into, into, into the uh, UK space. We have a responsibility as academics to support the industry within the country. And, um, and this is one of the ways that we can do it, by helping to prepare the next generation of cybersecurity experts. Cybersecurity is in everything. It prevails and, and, and leaches into everything that, um, that everybody is doing. And I think it's vitally important that we take that seriously as a country and we start investing in our young people. I firmly believe that you can only really learn cyber by doing cyber. Um, and therefore, the, the things we learn most in industry is when we're actually working on it, not necessarily sitting on an online course or something like that, is when you're actually doing the work. So in all my teaching, all my teaching is lab-based. It's all technical. It's all hands-on. If I want you to read lecture slides, you can go and read them in your own time. You don't need to read them to you. There's no benefit in that from a teaching perspective, in my opinion. Benefit comes from you working with other students, solving real-life problems, in the same way as we would have done in industry. And I think that's something that universities can really embrace and do. We have the facilities to be able to do it. Um, Cardiff's just built an entire new building to allow us to be able to be flexible in this space. Um, and I think that's the future. I think if you are running a degree, whether it be a master's or an undergraduate, and you are doing it on a lecture slide basis, then you are failing your students and you are not preparing them properly. We've developed in this last year a brand new master's in cybersecurity, and we've been linked up with PricewaterhouseCoopers to do that. They are very, very keen for us to develop a very technical master's. One of the complaints at the moment from industry that I've heard a lot is that the master's programs have sort of fallen by a wayside somewhat. They're no longer preparing somebody to be a master of the subject. Pricewaterhouse were very, very keen for us to develop a technical master's. The Welsh Government are supporting us. They provide fully funded bursaries for students from disaffected backgrounds to be able to do it. We've looked at every module and we've gone, how can we teach this in a, in a, in a physical way, in an actual way? And then we've adapted our labs. We've created a whole secure forensics lab in order to teach forensics. We've adapted all our labs to allow us to create as much opportunities for the students to explore the subject matter. Andrew Hood, lecturer in cybersecurity. Cardiff University. The way that Andrew talks about training undergraduates as researchers, equipping them with practical skills, encouraging them to start expressing, exploring ideas, and then building confidence in themselves, absolutely loved it. And it's really important because universities nourish independence and ideas. It's part of the pipeline that feeds a trained workforce into various sectors. The trained cybersecurity workforce, confident in their skills, starts to address the skills gap that we have in the sector. My name is Matthew Bokes. I'm a PhD student at the University of Kent. My uh, primary focus as research is biometrics on mobile devices and how we can test them because the environments and scenarios available for mobile devices is 
bigger than, say, any airport e-gate systems where it's much more static and control the environments that you operate in. Not quite related to my research, but something that's come up, I think, more and more in recent years is the ethical use of biometric systems. Some recent examples with the pandemic, you may have seen stories of using uh, facial recognition technology to track citizens when they were leaving the house. And more recently in Ukraine, using the facial recognition technology as part of their strategy, which is usually an organization that isn't quite so ethical, pictures scraped from social media sites. So there's this whole debate about whether this is ethical. I mean, they were fined by the ICO in the UK for, for doing this. So a lot of talk around that at the moment. The whole drive towards a passwordless society. So I don't know if you've heard of the FIDO Alliance, but they're big in this space. And that's, that's their main aim, really, is to come up with how can we go towards passwordless. And I know both Microsoft and Apple are, are driving this. And I think in their recent updates, they're trying to push for this. So the use of biometric sensors in your smartphone, these sensors are being more and more incorporated into, into your laptop devices. That's where I see this and biometrics playing a key part in driving this passwordless world. And I think because biometrics, and we carry on us all the time, can't really be changed. That's, that's where I see it fitting into the big picture. Matthew's talking to us about biometric systems. Biometrics, eye scans, fingerprints, that kind of thing. He's not only talking about the systems themselves, he's talking about their ethical use. This is particularly important because as biometrics are being embedded into laptops and whatever, people are getting less of a choice about sharing what is actually quite personal data. I've seen people needing to access a till using their thumbprint. And I do wonder whether it's the difference between being hired and giving your employer your thumbprint or not getting the job at all. People building new biometrics should be and really need to be considering these ethical implications. We're not saying that they need all of the answers, but even just thinking about imbalances of power and of information, perhaps even drawing colleagues in who do specialise in this kind of space. There is certainly a much bigger picture. Hello, my name is Mario Samanis. I'm a PhD student at the University of Bristol. I'm interested in uh, the security of industrial control systems, attacks on those systems, cascading effects of cyber attacks in interconnected critical infrastructures. For example, a power and a water system communicating with each other, how we can disrupt one system and see effects or disrupts in the other system. It's very important to have a lab environment to to be able to do practical research and test ideas, attacks or defenses in these systems and be able to program such systems, PLCs and so on. I'm interested in digital twins, which is something that we try to create currently. So this is what I think is very important. Critical national infrastructure is very important. More important as these infrastructures are were separated in the past, but now they, they are tending to be interconnected with each other and they are going to be interconnected with the internet and the grid and so on. The attack vectors are much greater, the, the vulnerabilities are much bigger, so we need to have a security plan for years to come in order to secure these critical national infrastructures. Marios is talking about critical national infrastructures, CNI, power, water, that kind of thing. They're more at risk now because not only are they getting connected to each other, which can be a problem because these systems are different to one another, and so when you stick them together, you might get holes in communication and weak spots. They're also being connected to the internet so that we can look at this data in real time, I imagine. These systems need to be protected from disruption, not just being turned off. Without them, even temporarily, we'd have a really bad time. Hi, my name is Maria Samin. I'm a doctoral student at University of Bristol under the CDT program. I'm in working for a cyber security, which is tips at the scale, that is trust, identity, privacy, and security as a scale. Cyber security has always been treated as a technical field, segregated part, and not considered as a fundamental part in organizations. And what I personally believe is that we are moving in an era where everything is connected. It, it needs to have multidisciplinary aspects because we need cybersecurity to be thought as our regulatory practices, social science aspects, how the users perceive security. Cybersecurity in the future wouldn't be a, you know, a buzzword. Everything is connected and users are becoming more interconnected with devices, more susceptible to different privacy harms, exploits and stuff. We are already in the era of IoT devices where we have like smart homes 
24 hour surveillance our system so this environment of smart cities surveillance outside our homes inside our homes we need to take steps now so we can have better implications in the future maria was talking about how cybersecurity really should have multidisciplinary aspects this is something that we've seen in quite a few of the conversations today john talked about lenses this is a good way to think about cybersecurity, especially as a starting point at the beginning of a project. If you expect to think bigger picture, be open to new ideas and inputs from different colleagues with different ways of thinking, perhaps we'll have fewer nasty surprises along the way. Hello, my name is Priyanka. I'm doing a PhD in cybersecurity from University of Bristol. My research area is around threat hunting. Every organization has the Security Operations Center, which we call the SOC. And they have different teams. They have security monitoring, they have the red team, they have the incident response team, and they have the threat hunting. Uh, most of the literature covers the area around the SOC. What are the challenges, how SOC performs and operates. But that's literature around the threat hunting. So my research is to understand how can we help threat hunters to perform better and what are the challenges right now they are facing. Because I work in SOC in my past, I understand there are lots of challenges SOC analysts face. I understand what they go through in their day-to-day job and I got an opportunity to do research. So I think that my first priority is to help them. Everything is digital now, everyone is using machine learning, AI, so I think uh, cybersecurity is really important because wherever you go you will find digital data, cameras, and so I think cybersecurity will be, it's going to be a blast. (laughs) Priyanka was talking about helping threat hunters do their job, looking for threats within companies. Threat hunting is a really important approach to dealing with cyber attacks because instead of retrospective or passive work after things have happened, these teams face real challenges in real time. As an ex-threat hunter, Franka has a general idea of where she wants to take this research, which is fantastic. By understanding what the challenges are that these people face, we can work to reduce the obstacles in their path. On that note, we're going to wrap this episode. There has been a lot, even if you haven't picked up everything. Hopefully, this demonstrates the value of cybersecurity work. A big thank you to the NCSC for hosting the event and inviting us. A massive thank you to everybody who's taken part. We'll leave you on this note. As far as cybersecurity is concerned, we protect things together or we don't protect them at all. What does this look like in real life? The world is a big place. Cybersecurity is just a part of it. Understand your context, know who you're working with, and understand what you want to achieve. Thanks for listening, everyone. See you next time. You can tweet at us at HelloPTNPod, and you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. The title there is PTNPod. See you next week. Bye. This has been a podcast from the Center for Doctoral Training in Cybersecurity at the University of Oxford, funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council.